Claire Consuelo Sheridan was the daughter of an Anglo-Irish father and an American mother. Raised mainly in England, her education involved private governesses, a Paris convent school, and a German finishing school. But she treasured her informal education in the countryside around the family estate in Inishannon, County Cork. She was a sculptor and a journalist, and it was her journalism which brought her to Dublin in June 1922. Through her cousin Winston Churchill, she made connections with political leaders on both sides of the treaty split. Claire was determined to get an interview with the anti-treaty leader Rory O'Connor inside the occupied four courts. Her book, In Many Places, published the following year, describes the encounter. If I wanted to get into the four courts and see Rory, there was not much time to lose. Accordingly, I went to the Republican headquarters and flourished my New York World credentials. I pointed out that it was not possible to write articles on the Irish situation if one had only heard the Free State side. I insisted it was enormously important that I get into the law courts. Accordingly, they looked up Sir John Ross, Lord Chancellor of Ireland, in the telephone book and got Rory. He answered vaguely that if I came down to the gate in about an hour, he might be able to see me. I was there in an hour, handed my letter of introduction through the bars and said I had an appointment with the General and that, moreover, he had promised not to keep me standing half an hour outside. On this, the gate was unlocked. I was given a chair and allowed to wait in the courtyard. The place swarmed with very young boys, some as young as 15. They had no uniforms, but were heavily armed. Cartridge belts over serge suits seemed the dominant note. Rifles were clicked and rattled while everyone laughed and joked and made merry I could not help thinking how many boys in England would love to be trusted with a gun, who perhaps would be more careful. It seemed as though the whole college of boys were being allowed to play with loaded rifles. Singh's Playboy of the Western World is no longer allowed to be acted in Dublin. The Irish have grown super sensitive, but here they were, armies of playboys, playing with fire, the real playboys of the Western world. After a long wait, I was led across two courtyards full of lorries and armored cars, one inscribed in big white letters, the mutineer. In the heart of a building, we climbed a wide stone stair. Through an office in which were men and women at desks, we passed into an inner office. There I was left alone with Rory O'Connor who placed a chair for me facing the glass panel of the door. We were easily watched. On the table next to me was a big revolver. I kept wondering if it were loaded. Next to him was still a bigger one. All the time we talked, he played abstractedly with the revolver bullets, arranging them in military formations. He talked in a very deep voice and very slowly and deliberately now and then he would look up from his regiment of bullets with a smile so sad it seemed full of foreboding. He was typically the Irish patriot, thin and ascetic, his white face sunken revealing the bone formation, his eyes a deep set. He was clean shaven and dressed plainly in dark clothes. His speech was that of a scholarly man and he seemed imbued with the spirituality of a fanatic. He said, I would rather see us back in Westminster under protest than part of the British Empire by voluntary consent. And added later, Irishmen will walk into English jails with their heads high, but they never can hold their heads high as subjects of a British colony. He claimed the Irish had the British morally beaten at the time of the truce, and that Lloyd George could have been forced into treating with de Valera if Michael Collins had not accepted what he did. But the treaty making Ireland a free state had lost them their strategic position and everything Ireland fought for. I asked him if his love of Ireland was a hatred of England. 
He turned on me that enigmatic smile. Ah, no, it's not a hatred of England. And after a pause, he said, Collins is not a leader. I know Collins. We have fought together. One gets to know a fellow pretty well under those conditions. Collins is not a leader. He is an opportunist. He is also a bully. Here he broke off to explain that he did not use the word bully in a derogatory sense. On the contrary, he thought it very useful and sometimes very important to be a bully. He said that if England's reason for not granting Ireland her freedom was a fear of Ireland's enmity in case of war, this was unfounded. If Ireland were a republic, she would be a friendly neighbour. But so long as Ireland is forcibly attached, Ireland will be a menace. I asked if he believed he could make a successful republic if he had it in his hands. Yes. He replied, I don't see why a republic shouldn't easily be a success. I don't dream of an Ireland smoking with chimney stacks. I don't think factories bring conditions of happiness, but we could be a very prosperous rural people and could afford to buy what ships we need for our export. At that moment, the telephone rang and from what I could make sense of the one-sided conversation, he must have been answering a press representative. No, it is not customary for us to answer speeches of British ministers. They may say what they like, it makes no difference. What is that? They are going to blow us out of here. Just say that when they come, we are ready for them. And he rang off. I said, surely you will not stay here. They will blow the walls off and the roof down on your head. You haven't an earthly chance. He shrugged his shoulders with a kind of fatalistic indifference. Then I'll go down in the ruins or in the flames. When we said goodbye, we looked at one another intently, but did not speak our thoughts. I imagined I was shaking hands with a man about to die. Alone, I made my way back across the courtyards to the gate. A ragged crowd, as in a French revolutionary film, were gazing through the bars. They made way for me to pass out and watched me wonderingly as I walked along the quays by the Liffey. Glancing back over my shoulders at the beautiful building with its central copper dome and its defiant sandbagged windows, they seemed a heroic little band of rebels in the midst of a world of opposition. Wednesday, 27th of June, 1922. Not until 10 o'clock at night did rumors of attack become definite. We were told by a Franciscan friar from Church Street that the four courts would be attacked after midnight. Trenches were dug inside the heavy gates. Our engineers brought out mines and began to dig up the paved blocks of the streets near the Liffey. Inside the four courts, men moved barbed wires, cleaned and checked ammunition, fitted rifle slings, cleaned rifles, automatics and machine guns and laid out spare parts. Captain Paddy O'Brien saw that the officers rechecked the ammunition. Dr. Jim Ryan arrived with nurses and a group of Cunningham girls to help him. A temporary hospital was fitted on the ground floor of the headquarters block. Across the river in the darkness, men were moving into position. We could see the dark shadows advancing. Armed cars purred their gentle throttles. Heavier Lancia drove up and down. Their trips entered the Four Courts Hotel and adjoining buildings which fronted parts of the courts. They opened the Bridewell gates, opposite the headquarters block, across the street, and marched in. Our position was being slowly surrounded. I wonder will they use artillery, said Joe McKelvey, as if talking to himself. They have no artillery, said Padder O'Donnell. The British might lend them some. 
At 3.40 a.m., a soldier handed a message to a guard at the main gate. It was an ultimatum. Evacuate the four courts by 4 a.m. or the building would be taken by force. Underneath the dome, the garrison had gathered. A Franciscan, Father Albert, in his brown habit, the hood over his head, his feet sandaled, spoke to us. I'm going to give you general absolution, boys. He looks like the St. Francis of my imagination, I was thinking as I looked at him. We all knelt down. Some of the men gripped their rifles instead of joining their hands. Others held their revolvers. We were dedicating our weapons as well as our lives. He then made a sign of a cross over us. Say an act of contrition now. The disjointed murmurs of voices. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. Then the priest pronounced the absolution. Ego te absolvo. I looked at my watch nervously. The minutes were slow in coming. Would artillery fire shake my knees in confidence? And would I disgrace my section? Time's up, said Rory. And as he spoke, a machine gun from outside echoed across the night. 